Well, we're continuing with this ongoing saga of the church that Jesus built. And by the way, when I say the church that Jesus built, that pertains to any given point in history, any point in time. We are up to the point where of the church that Jesus has built thus far. That's the best way to say it. Because he didn't build a church, then that was it. It's still a process ongoing. So we're when we speak of the church that Jesus built, we're actually speaking proleptically. We're speaking from the point of view of the end of history. When it all is said and done, when all that is going to be done has been done, when the fullness of the body of Christ, that's the church that Jesus built. In those days, we could say the church that Jesus built. It's a done deal. But right now, it's a work in progress. And we're reading about the early years of that work uh, in the book of Acts. And last time... In the book of Acts, we got to chapter 4, and I believe we made it all the way to verse 23. And I think I closed by saying we will begin in verse 23. A little, little recap here, however. You will recall that Peter and John had been called before the Jewish council the Re Jewish religious council uh, that involved the high priest and other religious authorities. And, of course, they couldn't really do anything because it would upset so many people because this lame man had been healed. Someone that everybody had known, had seen at the gate at the temple, begging for money, and had never taken a single step in his whole life, and now there he was leaping and praising God. And so what can you say if you're in opposition to the one and the people who did this, who performed this miracle, or whose names are associated with this great miracle? If you start speaking badly of them, then what are the people going to do? If you want to maintain the good graces of the people, then there's not a lot you can do about it. So what they did, they called them aside and said, listen, you are not to preach in this name anymore. And they said, uh, should we obey God or men? I think, and they said, I think you know the answer to that. Essentially, I'm kind of paraphrasing, but that's basically what Peter told them. So here now, the, the apostles, Peter and John, go back to their own company, meaning the church. The church that Jesus had built up to this point. In verse 23, we take up the account. When they were released... They went to their friends, that would be fellow believers, and reported what the chief priest and the elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, now we're going to read this prayer, and then we're going to analyze it, because there is some theological depth here. This tells you that the church was a thinking church. It was a theologically uh, knowledgeable church. And we'll, we'll explore as to why that's so. But this is not just a prayer saying, oh Lord, help us. You know, we all pray that. That's natural. That's normal. Uh, more to it than that. You can see what their understanding was at this point, keeping in mind that this was still in the early stages of the development of the church. And yet you see their theology was quite profound here. Now when it says they lifted up their voice and said, and then it quotes, I don't think everybody you know, voiced these same words at the same time. No, obviously one person spoke on behalf of the whole group, just as when we have opening and closing prayers here, and everybody says amen. But this, uh, whoever spoke this prayer, and it was on behalf of the whole assembly there, it is very obvious that the person had some training, some knowledge he picked up a lot of knowledge. Let's read the prayer and then we'll talk about it. Verse 24, And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, the word here is despota, despota, uh, first it's translated sovereign lord. It does refer to sovereigns, those, you know, the kings, and uh, sometimes it was used in the Greek world, it was used in reference to uh, uh, rulers. The word, again, is despota. It says, uh, who made the heaven and the earth. Now, this is not just any ruler, obviously. Who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. This is obviously a reference back to Exodus chapter 20 and verse 11. Almost a direct quote from Exodus 20 and verse 11, uh, which is the Sabbath commandment. 
you know, the reminder is on the seventh day is that God, it was God who in six days made the heavens and the earth and the sea, and that's the way it's worded, and everything in them, that is everything in the sea and the heavens and the earth, the birds of the air, the beasts of the land, the fish of the sea, and so on. Who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit. Now we're going to read, read what David said. The word servant here is uh, uh, peatus, peatus, I'm not sure exactly how the, where the emphasis belongs, but peatus. And you will see that Jesus himself is called uh, peatus and the related uh, peata later on. And sometimes it can be translated child, but it's obviously in, it's, it's a, child, a child in the sense of a servant, a child servant. Uh, in other words, an offspring servant. So he refers to David this way. It says that David spoke by the Holy Spirit. Now I want you to listen to these words. We, we read a portion of this psalm earlier. Psalm 2. Uh, it was quoted in, do you remember who, who used it earlier in the book of Acts? On the day of Pentecost, Peter. He quoted from Psalm 2. And here's the point. They recognized this as pertaining to Jesus. Even though it was written long ago by David, and probably originally David had in mind circumstances, conditions in his time, and yet they understand that it looks beyond the time of David. It looks to the time of the ultimate son of David, who happens to be also the son of God, that we understand is Jesus Christ. And he quotes from Psalm 2, Why did the Gentiles rage? The Gentiles simply means nations. It is so translated in some uh, versions of Scripture. Why did the Gentiles rage, the nations, and the peoples plot in vain? This is a dualism, a parallelism, where you see a statement like this, somewhat poetic, and you have two words meaning the same thing. Gentiles are nations and peoples. Talking about the same thing. The kings of the earth, another parallelism here, the kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers, kings and rulers, basically the same thing, the same class, were gathered together against, against whom? Against the Lord, in the Hebrew, Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, against the Lord and against his anointed. Now, who was the anointed in the Old Testament? David. He was King David. Why was he called the anointed? And that's the, you know, the word is Christ in the Greek. Mashiach in the Hebrew. But uh, why was he called anointed? Because that was the ritual that was used when they were pronounced king. You know, they, they poured oil on the head of the person who they anointed them with oil. And this was symbolic of, uh, it, it, it showed, it, it was a public display of this uh, kingly um, office being conferred to them. So David was the anointed one. Solomon after him was the anointed one. And this is speaking, they understand this is not speaking of David and Solomon though. It's looking far beyond their time. They understood it looked to the ultimate anointed one, the ultimate Davidic king, meaning Jesus Christ. So this is, this is you wonder, how could they know this? This is quite early. And the church understands this very clearly. Verse 27, for truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy child, servant Jesus. Now look, look at how he, the, uh, this prayer interprets that psalm, Psalm 2. Remember it mentions Gentiles or nations, nations and peoples, and it mentions kings and rulers. And of course it mentions God and his anointed, God the Father and Christ his Son. It says, for truly in this city, meaning in their time, their day, there were gathered together against your holy servant, child in some translations, servant in this one, uh, Peata, Jesus, whom you anointed, so there's a reference back to the one who was anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, there's your rulers, your kings and rulers mentioned in verse 26 along with the Gentiles and the peoples. Same groups mentioned there in verse 25. So they, you see that how they're seeing this, what did they have experienced, what they have watched and known to happen in their time as a fulfillment of this prophetic psalm concerning the Messiah. So, 
and the peoples of the peoples of Israel. Uh, and by you know Gentiles, not it's not just outside of Israel; it includes Israelites as well. When you're looking looking at peoples as a whole. To do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined them to take place. We'll comment some more on that. But first of all, how is it that you see you see right away that this this prayer was composed by someone quite knowledgeable, had some theological depth there, understanding that Psalm two and obviously other places in Scripture pertain to their time and to what is what they had experienced, had seen happen, and to Christ Himself. Well, if you would go back, let's just read a quick review on this. You can see how it is that they were so knowledgeable so early. Look at uh, Luke chapter 24. Luke 24. And remember, this is, uh, we're right at the end of Luke's gospel, the same author of the book of Acts. And here he's talking about <clears throat> Christ having appeared to his disciples and some of the things he said to them. It says, beginning in, uh, we want to take up the account there in about verse 44. It said, then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name, and so on. The point is here that I want to call your attention to, it was during this 40-day period between, or, or between uh, uh, after you know, his crucifixion and resurrection, and the time when he departed before the day of Pentecost. Uh, it was during this period when he, when he appeared several times to his disciples that he opened the scriptures to them and enabled them to see things from the scriptures they had not seen before. Now, you, could, you read through the Gospels and you can see they repeatedly didn't get it. But now then, something else is happening. Now they're beginning to see much more clearly. He's opening their minds to the Scriptures. And you notice the same thing back in the two men to, on the road to Emmaus. You see something similar said back there. It says, uh, when Jesus appeared to them, and they were talking about the things taking place. Let's just break right into the context here. Verse 32 says, They said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us? While he talked to us, they're, they're recounting their experience of having met Jesus on the road to Emmaus. While he opened to us the scriptures. So he opened their mind and their understanding to the scriptures by taking some time to explain how the scriptures, uh, how he fulfilled those scriptures. So this, this should tell us something right away. And as we've talked about before, when we were in Acts, the second chapter, uh, you see Peter there standing up and preaching, and he too now at this point has some really profound knowledge. He cites Psalm 2, he cites Joel's prophecy concerning the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and uh, another prophecy or two concerning the Messiah. So it's very clear that at this point, at this point, the disciples have acquired far greater knowledge in that short period of time than they did apparently through the whole ministry of Jesus. It's almost like you get the impression that the ministry of Jesus and all they experienced was kind of a lead up, lead up to uh, the, the real training. And I don't know if that's a, a correct way to say it. It's kind of, that's the impression you get, though, that they, their, their knowledge was lacking. But now then, he opens their understanding to the Scriptures, and they begin to see it as they never did before. I think that is pretty clear in the text. Now, I want you to notice something else, though, in Acts chapter 2. We mentioned it when we were back there. But in Acts chapter 2, you will see what these disciples, the 3,000 who were converted on the day of Pentecost, and uh, many others, no doubt, later on. But here it says in Acts chapter 2, look at verse 42. It says, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. So it's not as if the apostle, this kind of charismatic experience took place where there's a bunch of miracles and people uh, received the Holy Spirit and started speaking in tongues and things like that. And it was all emotional without any instruction, without any training, without any uh, teaching of Scripture. No, no. No, no. The, the apostles were very busy teaching the Scriptures, obviously teaching those things they had learned from Christ Himself. 
about the law, the prophets, the Psalms, those three divisions of Scripture, and how they found their fulfillment in Him. So they were abiding in the apostles' doctrine, they're their teaching, and fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. So this is what they were doing as they were assembling from day to day, from house to house, and also in the temple. Uh, this is what was going on. They were abiding in, hearing, sharing, and so on, the apostles' teaching. So they were being thoroughly taught about these things. So it's not really surprising in that light that when you get to Acts chapter 4 and you see the church praying that you have some theological depth there. An understanding that you might not expect in any other set of circumstances. So this is what you do find there. And uh, I think it's very interesting that they approach it, that this is their approach. Now, um, verse tw back to verse 28, Acts chapter 4 again, verse 28. It says, to do whatever your hand and your plan had, this translation said, predestined to take place. Uh, some others say had determined beforehand to take place. All means basically the same thing. But the question is, how did God predestine or determine beforehand the death of His Son if human free moral agency exists? In other words, if they had a choice in the matter. That's, what, that's a question that sometimes comes up. How could God have known so far in advance? Uh, how could He have predestined these things unless He assured that they would happen? And does that mean then that He put it into the minds of Herod and Pontius Pilate and the Gentiles and the peoples? Did He cause it? That's a question that always comes up. You have that's one of the points between Calvinists on one side, Arminians on the other, that they always butt heads over. That's one of many many questions that comes up. But you know, I think it's very how can you, how could you understand that that God could say beforehand that, for example, Judas Iscariot would betray uh, Christ? That this could be known beforehand. Uh, how could it be known beforehand that uh, Christ would be crucified? That men would do it? Unless, you know, the, the, again, the question is, unless God prearranged it. Did He manipulate those hearts and minds to cause people to do ungodly things? That does, that's not consistent, is it? Something wrong with that. Well, I think there's an easy answer to this, really. There's a pretty easy answer. And it's not simple foreknowledge, either. Because you start getting into some questions there, too. It says, how does He foreknow? You know, we don't, need, we don't even need to go there. Uh, let me put it this way. You know, I can predict with my finite, very limited mind, no comment please, <laughs> but, uh, but with my finite mind, I can predict, I can look at, let's, let's look at those cities in the United States where the worst crime rates are, every, every year, year by year. And I could predict that this year, at the end of this year, that there will be a lot of crime in those cities. <laughs> <laughs> I can predict that murder will be taking place this very week someplace in this country. And you know what? If I looked at the, st the uh, statistics very carefully, I might be able to give you a ballpark figure about how many we can expect. And it'd probably come out pretty close to, to accurate. Uh, other people have done that. I, I'm not going to do that. But, you know, the thing is, you know that evil exists, don't you? We know that. Everybody knows that. It exists in every nation. Uh, some, it's not because the people are different, it's just because the circumstances are different. Some nations, it's worse than in others. But uh, you, you, you can predict those things based on patterns. Okay, knowing that evil exists, what would it take for God to, uh, to bring about a prophecy without actually manipulating the minds and causing someone to do an ungodly thing? Well, it's, it's a, more of a negative intervention than a positive one. Let me explain what I'm talking about. i give, give you an example by going to uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Uh, this concerns the man of sin. How do we know he's even coming? How do we know? God, uh, what, if, what if he decides not to be the man of sin? Can he not do that? Second th yeah, you're right, he can. <laughs> Second, Second Thessalonians chapter 2, 
But I, but I think I can tell you how we know that there will still come a man of sin. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, let's just look at quickly verses 1 through 8. says, Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to Him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for the, that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first. Well, wait a minute. You mean a rebellion is predestined, predetermined? Where's, where did human free moral agency go? Well, keep, keep my earlier illustration in mind. How I can predict crime in certain cities in the United States. In just about any city, in fact. Unless the rebellion comes first, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of desolation, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God, do, not, do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And you know what is, now get this word here, restraining him. Restraining, that's a key word. And you know what is restraining him now so that he may be revealed in his time. So it's not a matter of finding someone who can fulfill this man of sin prophecy. It's a matter of restraining people to prevent them from fulfilling it. That's, that's the, you know, the man of sin, there have been many types, if you want to call them that, of the man of sin throughout history. But what is it that prevents the man of sin from appearing? What is it that prevents this rebellion, this final rebellion from taking place? It is, it is God himself. I, th I think through use of angelic agencies, perhaps Michael, perhaps Gabriel. But he uses these angelic agencies to restrain sin. You see that back in the book of Daniel. You have these princes, the prince of Persia being uh, resisting uh, the, 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 prop, the angel that was sent to Daniel. So you see this going on. So it's, in the case of Judas Iscariot, and in his case, you think about that, say, you mean that poor fellow, he didn't have a chance. It was predetermined for him. No, well, not really, not really. You see, Jesus knew what kind of person he was already by his choice wasn't something that was put into him. It was by his choice. And evidently, he would have done what he did sooner had he not been restrained. Because it was only late in, in the, the ministry of Jesus, just before the crucifixion, where re we read that Satan entered into him, into Judas. You mean Satan couldn't have gotten into him earlier? Apparently not, because he had been restrained. So this is how things can be predestined, as it were, or predetermined. It's not a matter of someone uh, coming to the fore who is specifically selected for that particular purpose. It's a matter of the existence of evil in the world and restraining it and preventing it until such time that evil can have its way. So that's, what, that's how... Uh, you could predict with accuracy that Jesus would be crucified. Fact is, he would have been put to death a lot sooner, a lot sooner, had the forces of evil not been restrained. In verse 29, continuing with the prayer, it says, And now, now this is a very interesting point right here. Pay very careful attention to this. I want you to notice this is the petition part of the prayer. Thus far, this is a lead up to now the request comes. This is the petition. This is what the church is asking for. Now think about this before we read it. If you lived in that, that society, or if we had similar circumstances here today, and our, the people representing us, were threatened, like Peter and John were threatened, and if we lived in such a society where these threats could sometimes use, lead to the threats from the religious authorities could sometimes lead to the Roman authorities getting involved, the civil authorities, and that could sometimes lead to people getting, being put to death. What do you think our prayer would consist of? Lord, deliver us. 
Now, I'm sure there are plenty of prayers to that effect. Nothing is wrong with that. Don't get me wrong. But you see some priorities coming forth in this prayer. I want you to look, look, look at what the petition is. It's not, Lord, deliver us from our persecutors. It's this, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. While you stretch out your hand to heal and, sign, and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy Piatus, your holy servant, child, Jesus. That's the petition. You see what their priorities were. They wanted the word of God to be preached. That was their priorities. And that was up, uppermost in their mind. They wanted that word to go out and they wanted the apostles, those who were assigned the task, and others, of course. They didn't want them to hold back. They didn't want them to go into hiding. They wanted, the, wanted them to be all the more bold in doing so. And as we find out, indeed, that's what happened. They were. They were. Verse 31, we, we can see that God certainly approved that prayer. It was pleasing to him. He liked what he saw. He saw their priorities. He saw their hearts. He knew their hearts were right. It says, And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. So that was the answer right there. And we know, of course, that Peter and John and the others not only the apostles, but evangelists and other people who had the ability to do this, uh, went about proclaiming the good news. And the church continued to be built, to continue to expand as more and more thousands in the years ahead would be added to it. Now, verse 32. Now, the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. That this, this is key to understanding what will now follow. One heart and soul. They were not disunited, were they? They were not at odds with each other, were they? They were not fighting and arguing and bickering about who's going to be in charge or who's going to do this or that or about one little nitpicky thing after another as you see in some places today. No, they were of one heart and soul. Obviously, they were very excited because they were witnesses to this incredible, these incredible things going on. Marvelous miracles and signs affirming, proving beyond dispute, beyond doubt, that Jesus was the prophesied Messiah. And so they believed to the core of their being that he indeed had ascended to heaven and was now at the right hand of God. So they were of one heart and one soul. And no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. No, this is not the beginning of communism. <laughs> not the beginning of communism. I used to hear that when I was a kid that uh, people said, well, communism came out of the Bible. No, this is not what we're talking about here. <clears throat> but uh, what it means simply is because they were of one heart and soul, well, they were attuned to the needs within their own community. You had the poor among them, and they were they they knew that, and they uh, and probably keep in mind that in all probability, uh, at this point, there were some some people who were still there from other parts of the world. Uh, after they came there for Pentecost, they were still in Jerusalem, still in Judea, and uh, you know they had their homes and their jobs and whatnot back home in other places. So, but they wanted to stay there and be a part of this. No doubt some of those were still there. Probably some had gone back already to their respective homes. They have to, you know, to take care of things there. But some were still there and they had needs, obviously. So this is simply telling, telling us that the whole community was mindful of the needs within it. And you would expect this if they're really followers of Christ, wouldn't you? If they really understood what he had done for them, now then they could do these things for each other and be in harmony and unity as they did it. In verse 33, And with great power the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of Jesus Christ, 
Now keep in mind here the reference, uh, we, we talked about it last time, uh, this is probably alluding to the fact that the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection so they had a great problem with the talk of the resurrection. And the Sadducees had a stronghold in the Sanhedrin and in the, the priesthood. So these were the people giving them the worst problem, the Sadducees. The Pharisees were giving them a rough time as well, or trying to, but the Sadducees are the ones who had a real problem with the concept of resurrection. And yet here they were, they were still going out there and preaching it. You know it didn't make Sadducees very happy. And great grace was upon them all. This means that graciousness was expressed through these believers. And you see it being expressed by their taking care of their own, uh, the poor among them and so forth, and uh, sharing their, their things with the others, and being uh, having this kind of spirit of unity. As this goes on to say, there was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet and it was distributed to each one as, had, as, uh, as any had need. So what we're reading here, you read about in this whole section, we have both the ordinary and the extraordinary being described. First of all, there's the ordinary graciousness that people who are in union together, in unity of spirit, that you would expect to find. You find it here in this church. Uh, you've certainly found it there. This is the ordinary things. Of course people are willing to share their goods with others. But some of the things here are described, that are described are extraordinary. Some went to lengths to sell properties in order to help out in that regard. This was extraordinary. Some of these things would be classified as uh, sacrifices that they made in order for the good of the community to help others. It says, thus Joseph, who was also called by the, apostle, by, by, by the apostles, Barnabas, almost merged those two words, apostles and Barnabas, <coughs> which means son of encouragement. So you see, he kind of lives up to his name there, doesn't he? As you will see here. He says, it says, he was a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him, and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, this is, a, this is kind of leads into something that's about to happen here. Uh, something we're going to read about in chapter 5. And we'll get, we'll, we're going to go into that. We won't take a whole lot more time, but we're going to go into that. Uh, I think it's important to look at this because you see Barnabas here is held up as an example of this kind of sacrificial service to the community, to the church that Jesus built. And when this something like this happens, well of course it, uh, it gets the attention of other people. And some people, when it gets their attention, especially if they realize that someone is being commended for his good works, and no doubt Barnabas was. He was. But he didn't do it for that purpose, obviously. He did it because the need was there. And it was a sacrifice he wanted to make, not for himself, but for the good of other people. And now some people, though, when seeing that, what do you think would happen? Man, I would love to be praised like that. Oh, I wish I could, well, look at him, he's got all that. I wish I could get that. I wish I had that standing. I wish I had that kind of recognition. You think anybody ever has that motive? Yeah, they do. Yeah, they do. We see it throughout the world. You know, and that's something we're called upon not to have. We're not to have that competitive spirit. We're not to try to exalt ourselves over others. We're not supposed to have that me, 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 me first spirit. We're supposed to kill that, get rid of it if it exists, and replace it with what you see exhibited here in Barnabas. So let's look at what happened. Now, I'll just say this. this, this what happens here, thus far, it's, it's been a beautiful story. It's been a story of encouragement, uplifting, 
You could get excited about it, thinking of the miracles that were taking place then, the preaching of the Word, the conversions, thousands being baptized in one day, and all the many later that were hearing the Word and were being converted as a result of it. And now then we have this little story thrown into it, and it's almost depressing. And because of this, some scholars have questioned the validity of it. So why in the world would Luke include this? It doesn't lift up anybody. It doesn't encourage, offer any kind of encouragement. In, in fact, it's like throwing a, a wet blanket on the fire that you got started here. But no, it's Luke chose to put it here for a very important purpose. It is a warning. It's something that needs to be said. Something that actually happened. Not a made-up story. No reason to believe that. None at all. But this is a part of inspired scripture. Verse 1, chapter 5. But a man named Ananias. You know what that word means? Ananias. In the Hebrew it means God is gracious. A man named Ananias and his wife Sapphira. The Aramaic meaning is beautiful. So what do we have here with this lovely couple? You have grace and beauty. Sounds wonderful, doesn't it? Kind of fits right into the story so far, doesn't it? Well, we see that something else was at work here. It says they sold a piece of property, and with his wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, there's nothing wrong with the way this is worded here. It doesn't underscore at this point, it doesn't underscore any kind of problem. If you own property, if you own a piece of property, and you go and sell it, if you want to contribute part of that to the church, that's up to you. If you don't want to, that's up to you as well. If you want to give it all to the church, you can do that, or to help the poor, whatever. But that's not, see, that's, that's not the problem, as we shall see. The problem was with something else. Then verse 3, But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? There's your problem. Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? Now, how did Peter know that he lied? Did he have spies? <laughs> so listen now, did they have a little executive, a little executive meeting saying, now listen, I want you to keep an eye on this group over here and uh, you, you know, some of these folks, I'm not so sure about it. Uh, we want to expose them as soon as, no. No, he didn't have any spies. He had the Holy Spirit. That's what he had. So this was no doubt revealed to him miraculously, supernaturally, what was going on here. So he says, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? How did he lie? Obviously, he came forth with a sum of money and said, I give it all. This is what I got for the land. And I'm laying, why? why do you think he did that? Recognition, of course. It's not spelled out for us here in the story. That's why sometimes people get confused when they read it. But this is obviously what was in view here. What was what Peter was talking about. He lied, told a whopper. You know. <laughs> why? So he could be recognized. You know, oh, look at this great sacrifice that I have made. And it, it was a conspiracy. He wanted that recognition, and yet he profited in it. Now, there's something else going on here. You know, you know the scripture. We don't need to turn there. Something about the love of money. Love of money. You remember that one? Not the root of all evil. It is a root. You know, what that means is money is a root of evil. It means it's a, out, out of this love of money. You see, it, you see it in the society, in the world today. You see it. Uh, you see it in the ancient world. But if you have a love of money, that's really a love of what? It's, it, it becomes an idol, but it, it's all self-centered, isn't it? It's self-centered. It really grows out of a sense of pride. When it's, uh, there's nothing wrong with making money. Nothing wrong with making lots of money. I hope you do. Everybody that's in business, or have, if you have a job, I hope you do make a lot of money. And, uh, the, and, and, you know, that you use it well. Nothing wrong with that. God is the one, we're told in Scripture, who gives us the power to gain wealth, to create wealth. 
Uh, he's the one that does that, and so we need, but we need to credit him with it. But uh, the the point here is that there's a love of money. What that again? What I was about to say was, what that means is that when you have this kind of love of money and the pride, the self-centeredness that is associated with it, that kind of love of money, then it results in all kinds of evil. In other words, out of it come lies and deception and just an amplification of, of all sorts of things. And you see that, for example, in the corporate world. You see it throughout the world, both now and in history. So that's, what the, that's part of what is going on here. He wanted to keep back part of it for himself, probably the larger percentage. We're not told how much, but probably so. Because he had this problem, and so he lies about how much he's giving to make it appear that he's making this great sacrifice for the benefit of the community. And Peter sees this as lying to the Holy Spirit. And this is what Peter says, that while it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? Yeah, it was his. That's why I say if you have property, it's yours. You can do with it what you want. You can sell it. You can give whatever percentage you want to, uh, to me. <laughs> and I'll take any percentage you'll give me. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but you can, you can, you can uh, contribute to whatever you wish, some kind of charity or whatever. But you don't lie about it and say it's the whole thing. While it remained unsold, it did not remain your own. And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? You know, you weren't under any compulsion to do this. You chose to do it, but then you lied about it for your own, for your own advantage, selfish advantage. Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. Now, he, he was lying to men, but Peter says, no, that's not the important thing here. You're telling a lie to, to me to others here. That's not the, the issue. The, re the thing is, you're, you're, you think you're lying to God. You are. You're lying to God. You're, you're not pulling the wool over his eyes, though. He sees what the motivation is. When Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last. In other words, he dropped dead on the spot. Now, this is why it's so depressing. At first glance, if you don't think it through, it seems like this was such a minor offense and you see less, less compassion from Peter shown to Ananias than you see Jesus showing to Judas. And you see less still when poor old Sapphira comes walking in the room. <laughs> and it says, And great fear came upon all who heard of it. I imagine so. Up to this point, it's been one miracle after another. And now then, this is a miracle they probably didn't expect. Man drops dead. Not a positive miracle. Great fear came upon the, all who heard it. Verse 6, the young men rose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. After an interval of about three hours, his wife came in not knowing what had happened. Now, you read, again, you read just a surface reading here without thinking it through. It sounds like Peter was a terrible guy. No compassion whatsoever. Let's look at what he says. And Peter said to her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. Well, he knew she did. He, knew, he already knew the answer to that. But here he asked the question. Well, I guess he's giving her the opportunity. He's going to let her prove to herself. And she said, yes, for so much. In other words, she's lying too. But Peter said to her, you know, again, think of compassion. <laughs> How is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Ooh. I understand how people read this and they think this this just doesn't fit here. I mean, this, this is too the, he's he's too cold and calloused. But to remember, this is a summary. 
It doesn't get into the details of what was really going on here, the details of the conspiracy, and it was a conspiracy. Uh, it, it doesn't even tell us whether Ananias and Sapphira were actually members of the church. We don't know for sure. We assume they were. They were in association with the church, but could it be that they were not even converted? They don't act converted, do they? <laughs> no. It could be that they weren't, that they were false brethren who came in and people just gave them the benefit of the doubt until this evil was exposed. That's a possibility, yes. Immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. So it's not that Peter was being calloused and cold, it's just that he knew what was about to happen. The Holy Spirit had revealed it to him. Uh, what choice did he have in the matter? He understood the gravity of the sin. And he knew what God's will was. And all he could do was pronounce it. And that's what he did. So she fell dead. When the young men came in, they found her dead and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. It's like in the old gun smoke days. Somebody dies, you go right then and bury them. <laughs> Always wondered about that watching gun smoke. Said, why do you, they don't even, nobody knows where their loved ones, <laughs> what happened to them? <laughs> Don't bother reporting it, just, well, Chester, dig a hole, bury him. <laughs> Sounds like what they did here. <laughs> and great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard of these things. I imagine so. But you know, had it been up to me, this section we just read, I would have rather, I would have rather jumped from chapter 4, the end of chapter 4, where you have all this... Uh, uh, this good stuff going on, all the spirit of unity after right on the heels of talking about the miracles and the apostles being threatened and the church lifting up its voice in prayer and all these positive, strongly positive message, skip right over this part and go to verse 12 where it says, Now many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles. That sounds better, doesn't it? <laughs> A little more positive. But no, it was important to put this part in here. It's important. I think some lessons come out of it. One we've already talked about, the love of money. Once it takes possession of a person, can lead to all kinds of evil. For it is motivated by self-serving pride that constantly needs feeding. That's the way it works. It's self-serving pride. It, it constantly demands to be fed more and more. It's like an addiction. Along the way, you think about an addiction, people you've known who've had addiction problems, uh, if they let the, the, the addiction go unchecked, then after a while it grows and grows. It, it, it consumes them. And that's the way it is with pride. It requires more and more and more, like a powerfully addictive drug. And of course, another lesson, we've mentioned it, Ananias and Sapphira, they just simply wanted to be, they wanted the praise that Barnabas had. Barnabas, though, he wasn't a prideful person. He wasn't seeking praise. He was seeking the good of the, the body. But these two wanted the praise. And also, there's something else I think that needs to be said. And that is, we often look around the world today, look around the church today, and we think, man, I wish it could be like it was in the days of the apostles. I wish we could see these kinds of miracles. Hey, I, I do. I'd like to see more healings than I see. I'd love to see more healings than I see. You know, pray for people. We pray sometimes. We pray, uh, we go over the prayer request here, and, and you, you go home and pray. And we mention some of these people sometimes and all who are afflicted here in the opening or closing prayer. And we pray. Sometimes we pray very diligently and still don't see the healings we would love to see. We like to see people restored to health and sometimes it get worse. You know how that is. So of course we want to see that. We'd like to see these things. And it only confirms the faith that you hold when you do see miracles. And this is what was going on there confirmation. But you know, anytime, I, I think what you can really say here is that the presence of God 
was there. When you're talking about the Holy Spirit, that's what you're talking about. God was present in this community in an extraordinary way because this was the foundation. The foundation was still being laid. The, the apostolic office was still in place. It's not in place today. Regardless, claims to some people claiming to be apostles equal to the twelve, they're not. No, this was a foundational office. The foundation was being laid. The Spirit was present, meaning God, God's presence was there in an unprecedented way, in a profound way. It is reminiscent of something else I think about from the Old Testament. When God wanted to be, would have been present with Israel, but Israel went into sin. They made the golden calf, remember? Fell into idolatry. And God says, stand back, Moses. Stand back. I'll make a nation of you, but I'm going to destroy this people. And if not for Moses' intervention, he would have. It's the only thing I can make of the text. And even though, even though he didn't destroy them, and he did say he would fulfill his promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, take them into the land, make a nation of them, and so on. Uh, nevertheless, he says, I will send my angel before you. I will not go in their midst. Why? Because this is a stiff-necked people, he said. And he would break loose upon them. His wrath would break loose upon him if he were in their midst. That's the, that's the, the point that's being made there. And even when they... At first, before the tabernacle was finally erected and placed in the midst of Israel, at first, the tent of meeting, it was called, was outside the camp. That's where Moses went to meet with God. And anybody in Israel who wanted to meet with God, who wanted to be in that special presence, had to go outside the camp. What's the, what, what is the message there? When God is present, when God is present, yes, great things happen. When God was present in this profound way that we're reading about here in the book of Acts, marvelous things were happening. Signs and miracles and great wonders affirming that Jesus was Messiah. Affirming God's activity with these people. But you know where there is, where God's work, God's spirit is present and at work in such a profound and powerful way, there's also a heightened accountability on the part of the community, isn't there? And in this community, you had a couple of people whose names should have conveyed a character of graciousness and beauty, but turned out to be liars, involved in a conspiracy, and therefore, this account needed to be placed there because, you know, when you have the presence of God like that, then you can, not only do you have wonderful things happening, but you also have this element of accountability that has to be there. And so, in this case, for the good of the community, God acted. He said, this cannot be tolerated. So... Even though that's a little bit of a depressing note, <laughs> nevertheless, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a message for us, isn't it? isn't it? I think you can see why this needs to be there. Why it needs to be there. But back to verse 12, and we'll finish it up here just in a moment. It said, Now many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles, and they were all together in Solomon's port, uh, portico. None of the rest dared join them. This is the rest. This, we've already been introduced to some of these. It's called the rest. Sadducees, Pharisees, and, and others. People who were opposed to the movement that was taking place. But the people held them in high esteem. A lot of people were being drawn to this. And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord. Get that? More than ever, even after this tragic, what seems to us to be such a tragic event of the Ananias and Sapphira. More than ever were added to the Lord multitudes of both men and women, so that they even carried out the sick into the street and laid them on cots and mats, that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. The people also, you know, this is something, this is, this is not an example for us today. What you have, what you have today, you see certain people uh, trying to Im imitate these things and putting on a show. You know what it's really about? 
Same thing that Ananias and Sapphira were about. Themselves and money. Yep, money. But they brought him, they, they recognized that God was at work in these men. And if they could bring him out, let Peter's shadow, just to, at least let his shadow fall on them that they might be healed. You know, if you can't reach out and get to everybody, if you can't touch them, you can't pray over them and all that. In, in any case, you see the point here. The people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. We'll end it there, and next time we'll take up the account in verse 17, and we'll see how the apostles find themselves in trouble once again. <laughs> but then you also see how they're rescued yet again. So we'll take that up next time.